Um, okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, I am Leith Altamimi. I am the newly uh, present, uh, appointed president of Semi Europe. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this event. Uh, it is um, our new initiative, uh, it's the executive program initiative, uh, which we introduced this year. And we very much hope that you enjoy it. Uh, the goal of this executive initiative is to listen to the executive level from, the, from our global industry uh, and to, from executive perspective, uh, what are the latest developments in the industry, uh, and most importantly also is what can we learn from that, and particularly for this event is how can we leverage that and learn from that for uh, semiconductor industry in Europe to strengthen that, uh, to make it more relevant uh, as part of our global semiconductor industry. Um, I have the pleasure of um, introducing three keynote speakers. This is in the course of today and tomorrow. Uh, this afternoon we have two gentlemen. Dr. Jones um, uh, will be the first speaker. I will have the pleasure to introduce shortly. Uh, Dr. Jones is um, C founder and CEO of IBS. I'm sure he's very well known to most of you here. Um, he has been in our business for over 26 years. Uh, he has very valuable experience in interface and support for mo major global opportunities. Uh, all the companies from manufacturing design like Intel, Broadcom, Qualcomm, ARM, uh, semi, uh, ST Microelectronics, SMIC. So basically very wide experience all the way from manufacturing to foundry to IDMs to design houses. Um, he has um, also been involved in advanced technology concepts. Uh, including smartphones and the most uh, recent, most relevant is the IoT, the, uh, the IoT and the also other high volume, high volume devices. Um, Dr. Jones has um, deep and very uh, wide experience, um, in, not only in our semiconductor industry, but also in China uh, and Chinese industry. And hence, uh, his uh, speech this afternoon is on China. Uh, opportunities and technologies, um, and hopefully we can learn from that uh, what, uh, how can we more, be more relevant and we can benefit from this. Dr. Jones, please join me to welcome Dr. Jones. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate being here today. In terms of uh, IBS, uh, we are based in Silicon Valley. Uh, we've actually been in business about 27, 28 years. So we do work with most of the major corporations regarding the um, technology roadmaps, uh, also strategic issues regarding global participation. Uh, how do I make this go forward? Oh, sorry, okay, thank you. So the topic today will focus quite heavily on China and out of this, uh, we'll try and extract what does it mean for Europe. Um, China today is viewed as a potential market for Europe, but we think this will change. We think it's going to be important to establish strategic relationships with Europe. Uh, I go to China probably about every six weeks and have written two books on China. The first one was called China America, which was published by McGraw Hill. The second one, is called Globalization of China, and it deals with how China is changing from being low technology to high technology. And actually, it was published in Mandarin, and it was on the bestseller list for nonfiction in China for a while. So as I mentioned, we are seeing China evolving from to becoming high technology in a number of areas. Uh, one example is that in 2015, more than 50% of all smartphones produced globally will be supplied by Chinese companies. This includes Huawei, Xiaomi, Coolpad, basically a number of, of, of companies. But this is a, this is a major trans, uh, transformation. Obviously, a big market is in China. Uh, but the, you know, the, the coming from being lagging in technology to supplying 50% of smartphones that's a significant achievement. Uh, a more significant uh, op achievement or potential threat, you might call it, is that China will be the leader in 5G. 
if you were to look at um, 3G, China was way behind. And China developed the TDS CDMA, which was a really a major strategic error. In 4G today, China has about 300 million users out of a total of 1.4 billion subscribers. But the intent of China is to become number one in 5G. Our assessment right now is that China is spending over $2 billion per year in R&D for 5G and uh, developing or driving the globalization of the standards for 5G. So th this, is, this, is, this is a major opportunity, and at another level, it is a major threat. So how does one respond? Well, one can respond by trying to uh, uh, expand investments in Europe and in the US, or co cooperate. And we think the bigger opportunities are in cooperation. Um, the China government right now is projecting or trying to spend about $20 billion to establish a global foundry capability, uh, also to establish uh, DRAM facilities, also 3D NAND. Uh, I met uh, fairly recently with a new chairman of SMIC, and his plan is to build a $10 billion foundry business by 2020. And of course, there's collaboration right now with IMEC uh, for 14 nanometer FinFETs. Our assessment is that that collaboration will not give a competitive capability. And the reason being that uh, we do see TSMC developing seven and also 10. So by the time the 14 nanometer of SMIC, which is 2020, will be up, it will not be competitive. So even though we see some positive activities, um, we also see what we view as non-well-focused activities. Uh, there are activities to bring in DRAM capacity. PowerChip is putting a facility in Herfei. Again, in our opinion, not competitive. Uh, there is the acquisition of ISSI. Uh, that's a small company which will give access to IP. But something bigger has to be done. Uh, we do see activities in 3D NAND. We have spent a lot of time analyzing Samsung in 3D NAND. Right now, they're on their third generation. Unless there's collaboration with a leading company, which could be Toshiba, could be SK Hynix, could be, we don't think that, that the 3D NAND will be successful. So even though we do see a lot of initial activities, um, again, we do not see what we view as competitive capabilities so far. The acquisition of Omnivision, uh, which is basically being led by WA Capital, that is a good acquisition. That gives China access to image sensors and also some initial capabilities in ISP. And we think ISP, image signal processing, will be the next big thing in semiconductors. Uh, what you see in, in, in the new generation of cars, for collision avoidance, up to 20 cameras. And of course, a lot of activities in Europe, basically Audi, Mercedes, um, also Continental, uh, Bosch. These are leaders in the uh, EDA space. And of course, every image sensor needs uh, ISP. And also, if you look at the new cameras, you need image recognition capabilities. Uh, and of course, what you need for ISP, you need very low power consumption. And we have been proposing or promoting very actively for a number of years FTSOI as that technology. But to, so far, China has not adopted FTSOI, but we think that will change in the next year or so. Um, the acquisition of such chip pack, uh, that is a good acquisition. Uh, again, access to good IP and good technology. Uh, the RF power business of NXP has been acquired. $1.8 billion for a business that has revenue of about $400 million. Uh, that's a very high price, um, but the technology is good. And the technology will be used for the base stations. So what we see in China is a lot of activity. Some of it is very well planned. Some of it is well implemented. Some of it, though, is not well focused. And again, that is, the, that is basically uh, common in terms of an aggressive uh, environment of building capabilities very rapidly. Uh, we also see emphasis on big data. 
Um, this is to improve efficiencies of cities, energy efficiency, also uh, improve traffic. Uh, supercomputer capabilities in China are basically pretty good. Uh, quite often they're based on the processes of Intel, Nvidia, et cetera, but becoming competitive. Um, Cisco has just now signed an agreement with Inspur. Uh, we think that's a good agreement. So again, big data is, is, is going to be another area of very high growth. And what we see in China is probably a fairly systematic approach to building capabilities. Um, we are seeing the, the advent of high definition video. Uh, Samsung to us is the leader probably in, in high definition displays, 4K, uh, 8K, and now 11K. Uh, China has spent about $10 billion on establishing display capacity. $10 billion. And um, it's becoming competitive. And I'll show you a chart later. About 50% of smart televisions pro produced globally will be produced by Chinese companies in 2017. Uh, we do see medical, uh, the telemedicine industry, the industrial applications, all of these benefiting from the high definition uh, video. So again, this is an area where you do see, again, significant emphasis in China. Um, from a top level perspective, GDP growth in China has slowed. Um, is, this, is this a big problem? Well, if you're in the commodities field, like copper, it is a big problem. In high tech, though, it's not a problem. Um, what's happening in high tech is increased investment. Uh, if, the old if the old technologies are slowing down, you invest in new technologies. So we're seeing, we're seeing a significant reduction in the factory uh, environment where you have unskilled labor, uh, increased use of robots. Um, Honhai is going to put in a million robots. Uh, but the acceleration in terms of, um, of high technology. Uh, we are seeing a slowing in exports. Of course, part of it is because of the slowing in the global GDP growth. Uh, we do see some increase in con local consumption, but it's not a big number yet. But what China is doing in 2015 is increasing investments in infrastructure. Infrastructure will represent 20% of GDP this year. 20%, that's a big number. So we do see the emphasis on big projects. The high-speed rail system is excellent. Uh, big investments in airports, big investments in logistics. So again, we're seeing, we're seeing these uh, big, big plans, big investments. And of course, China is very good in terms of these big projects. Um, we expect China to continue to have a large manufacturing base. Uh, labor costs are going up. Overhead costs are, are increasing. But in our opinion, Manufacturing is important. We think the US is making a strategic error in reducing manufacturing. Uh, Germany, of course, continues to emphasize manufacturing. I think that's a good thing, because manufacturing gives you employment, also lets you have good exports. Uh, but again, what we do see in China, as I mentioned, is the change from the low tech to high tech. Um, what we also see in China is that government agencies are very active in supporting industry. A part of this is to build employment. Part of it is to um, change the balance of trade. Another part is for security. Uh, there's a feeling that security is very important. So we are actually working closely with the China Academy of Sciences, the Minister of Industry, uh, the different uh, financial institutions. So again, we see the, the China uh, government uh, investments in high tech being very important. Again, we think that's, that's a key part of building industries. Um, you know, capitalism involves entrepreneurship, but also you need um, top level support because the world is not a level playing field. So I think I mentioned some of, some of these points already. Uh, we are seeing IoT in China becoming a big area. Uh, IoT, in reality, is not a big market yet. Um, smart watches have not taken off. But I think in the next five to 10 years, IoT will, be, will become a big market. Probably today, the winner in IoT is smart cameras. Um, and I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, we do see we do see um, the um, ISP being a key part of that. 
Uh, we also see significant investments in high power. Uh, we do see the, I, I was involved, I was actually on the board of a company doing uh, packaging and testing in China. And there was a joint venture with Mitsubishi Electric to, invert, to do inverter motor controls. And this is for the appliance industry and of course also will be applicable to automotive. So if you look at some of the statistics for China, uh, China in 2014 produced 84% of all smartphones produced globally. Now this includes the Apple phones, this includes the Samsung phones, but this again is a significant achievement. Uh, an increasing percentage of uh, notebook computers, an increasing percentage of, the, um, of tablet computers. Uh, smartphones, I already talked to you. China's producing more than 50% of smartphones. Uh, we also show the more than 50% of, of, of high definition televisions. And then the, on the left hand side at the bottom, um, we do see the growth in bandwidth. 5G will be disruptive. 5G will initially support one gigabit per second, will go to 10 gigabit per second, uh, will support multiple streams of high definition video, but you can also have low data rates. So automobiles will be connected to 5G. Automobiles will be connected to the cloud. So 5G is disruptive. So not only do you have the, what we call smartphones, now we're actually calling them super phones because you'll, be, you'll have very high performance uh, computing power, but also the base station infrastructure will change significantly. So if you look at the base station leaders, they're Huawei and Ericsson, and, uh, but you'll need new filter technology, you'll need more new uh, power amplifier technologies, you'll need a whole range of new technologies to support uh, the 5G. So from an innovation point of view, semiconductor industry is not slowing down. Electronics industry is not slowing down. Maybe we're seeing a slowing in terms of migration to smaller feature dimensions, uh, but we don't, see, we don't see a slowing in terms of the overall growth rate. So innovation is still very, very high, but the, but the, but the structure of the market is changing. The structure of the market is becoming more global, and of course, being in Silicon Valley, we see a lot of that. Silicon Valley has a lot of innovation. But again, there are things, a lot of things happening outside Silicon Valley. By the way, what we do see in Europe is very high levels of innovation. You have some very clever people here, but I think the market leveraging or the market uh, leveraging is not as effective as in some other places. So again, I think uh, focusing on China, I think will be becoming increasingly important. So this is what we show in terms of the global semiconductor market. Um, we are showing a decline in 2016. Um, and the reason is some saturation in the uh, smartphone market, even though we do show the China market growing. Um, we do see a migration in smartphones from the higher priced to, to the middle priced. So that is impacting the market. Um, and we are seeing another factor in terms of this is a reduction in gigabyte prices or gigabit prices for DRAMs. DRAM prices doubled because of the uh, consolidation, now they're coming down. Um, that will impact CAPEX for next year. We think CAPEX also for the semiconductor industry will decline for next year. Uh, we do see very strong growth in 3D NAND. Samsung is clearly the market share leader and the leader in technology by two or three years. Um, we do see some plateauing or slowing in DRAM, um, but again, we do see again, uh, as I mentioned, some slowing next year. And this cycling is common for the semiconductor industry. Then longer term, we basically do show good growth. We're talking about almost $600 billion in uh, 2025. Of course, the further out you go, the less uh, clear the, uh, the visibility. But long term is positive, but we do have some short term pressures. If you look at the China semiconductor market though, basically we, are, we don't show a slowdown. We do slow a slowdown next year, but not a decline. And um, we do show in 2025, the China semiconductor market to be $336 billion, uh, about 57% of the total global market. Uh, of course, this now also includes the exports as well as consumption in China. A uh, more important chart is this one. This again shows the total consumption in China. And then at the bottom, we show the consumption of Chinese companies. 
So this is the consumption of uh, Huawei. This will be consumption of Xiaomi, of Lenovo. And you can see back in 2010, maybe about 10%, uh, actually we show 15.8% of the total consumption in China. If you go back to 2000, it's about three or 4%. In um, 2025 though, Chinese companies will consume about 53.8% of the total consumption in China. That is a major change. That is a dramatic change. Now, when you project to 2025, you know, how good are you? Well, obviously, there's some, some, some room for error here. But this is a significant change in the, in the composition of the China market. Um, another part, in addition to the high consumption in China, we, don't, we see also it becoming increasingly difficult to sell into China. You can't develop a product in Europe and just expect to sell it in China. If you don't have some manufacturing um, ecosystem in China, it'll, be, it'll become increasingly difficult to sell into China. Uh, Qualcomm has been fined about a billion dollars. Um, and in our opinion, they have done nothing wrong. There's a complaint that they basically overcharged. But again, that's a gray area. Uh, so again, to me, th this, this requires a strategy for China which is different from just exporting into China. And of course, with the growth of the Chinese electronics industry, there's going to be the need to develop products specifically for China. So design centers, supply chain support in China will become increasingly important. Um, the other thing we also look at is the growth of the Chinese semiconductor industry. Um, if you were to look at the supply from Chinese companies, um, in the 2000 time frame, sorry, 2010 time frame, uh, about, only about 4.5% of the semiconductors in China were supplied by Chinese companies. So this includes high silicon, this includes spectrum, this includes uh, uh, basically a whole bunch of companies, uh, RDA, et cetera, et cetera. So we track these companies very closely. We do think in 2020, high silicon will become a $10 billion company. Uh, we know Thai Silicon very, very well. They have about 5,000, 6,000 design engineers right now. Average age is about 31, 32. Uh, and they've been doing some work with TSMC at 60 nanometers, FinFETs, having problems. Uh, having significant problems because of low leakage, sorry, high leakage and low yields. And of course, they're starting to do 10 nanometers, 7 nanometers. Again, I think that's going to be an issue. Uh, so frankly, we're telling them, go FDSOI. Uh, but again, I think that's another story. Uh, but if you look at the realistic, based on the Chinese companies investing the 100 billion potential, um, they can potentially supply about uh, 34, 35% in 2025. The Chinese government tell me it's too low, basically it's to be over 40%. Frankly, we don't believe it. Uh, but we do see a strengthening of capabilities. The other side of the coin is that even with the optimistic numbers, foreign companies will still supply almost 60% of the semiconductors in China. So it's still going to be a big market, even though you do have this big investment in building semiconductor companies in China. So it's a worthwhile market to focus on. It's a worthwhile market to invest heavily in. Um, so if the, the other area we do track is the global foundry market. Um, we basically are going to be modifying these numbers a little bit because we're seeing uh, some significant weakening in Q4. Uh, TSMC have guided down, and TSMC is about uh, 47, 40 percent of the foundry market. Uh, but even with that down guidance, TSMC, though, will still grow around uh, 10 percent this year. They've guided that they will grow 10% per year through 2019, 2020. Frankly, we don't believe it in this environment. Um, so we will be modifying these numbers, but you do see uh, the 107 coming up. Uh, and again, that's a marketing tool. Uh, whether it'll be, uh, what the technology will be though, I think is still open. But overall, we're positive on the foundry market. Um, and we're positive in terms of continued migration to smaller feature dimensions. Uh, but again, in terms of the timing of the technologies, uh, the costs are increasing, and also we do see 
uh, the cost of the IP, the cost of IP qualification designs also going up. Uh, but again, on an overall basis, we're pretty positive. We continue, though, to see, in addition to the 300 millimeters, fairly strong demand for 200 millimeters. And we've been quite surprised by the number of designs in 0.18 and also 0.13. And of course, some of those related to power management, but we do see a fairly broad-based um, uh, demand for wafers. So overall, we're positive on the wafer environment. If you look at the China market, though, we do see the China wafer supply was 7.8% of the total global foundry market in 2010. We do have China supply, though, becoming 26.4% in 2025. So this does include the growth of SMIC, uh, we actually um, were the, we did provide support for the IPO of Wahon Grace, uh, done with Goldman Sachs. And uh, basically we looked very closely at the uh, 200 millimeter capacity. So you do see China coming up. Uh, and of course, significant investments. Uh, our assessment, as I said earlier, for them to invest in FinFETs is a strategic error because they will never catch up with what's happening in terms of the existing supply base of TSMC, Samsung, and Global Foundries. Uh, so we think that for them, FTSOI is by far the best technology. But as I said, so far, it has not been agreed to. But again, we do see, as I said, uh, significant growth. And a big part of this is the funding from the China government. Uh, as I said, potentially $20 billion for wafer manufacturing. And that's a big subsidy. And it is basically a subsidy that's going to be given uh, to the existing foundry vendors or where there will be joint ventures with foreign companies. Uh, we are seeing, though, by the way, um, the UMC facility in Jaimin. And then uh, TSMC is evaluating um, a fab either in Nanjing or Pudong, but no decision in which technology to put in. The other area we, we track is design starts. And design starts, this is based on products going into volume production. Uh, so again, if you look at the China uh, growth, quite, quite high. In fact, in 2025, probably about 30% of all the design starts globally will be in China. Uh, so there are about 500 fabulous companies in China right now. Most will not be successful. But this, this is a big change, uh, about 30%. And of course, uh, some, many of these will be in lagging technologies, but some will be in 10 nanometers and, and 7 nanometers. So in addition to this chart, we actually have the um, design stars by technology node, by geographic region. I didn't bring it today because it's too busy, too much information in it. But again, th this, is, this is a big change. Uh, and again, it shows the, 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 the increased uh, importance of semiconductors in China. So to us, semiconductors are key building blocks for electronics equipment. And um, so to focus on semiconductors is a very key part of uh, having strong electronics equipment. I've worked extensively in Japan, and we've seen Japan cutting the investments in semiconductors, cutting, cutting. And of course, when that happened, you saw initially Japan losing competitiveness in computers. And then you saw Japan losing competitiveness in smartphones. The one area that Japan is remaining fairly strong in is automotive. But again, potentially weakening also in automotive. So if you cut semiconductor consumption, not only do you lose the revenue for semiconductors, you can also lose competitiveness in other areas. And of course, in Europe, you're very strong in, 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 in MEM sensors. In, in, and I think that is, that is going to be a key asset for you going forward. But again, this design starts data shows significant changes over time on a global basis. Again, when we, when we look at 2025, you know, that's many years out. Uh, so, you know, is it going to be 30, 31, 32 percent? Obviously very difficult to estimate. But the trends are very clear. The trends are very clear. Uh, the other thing that you do have is the increase in the revenue that you need per design. We'll do a lot of design costs. And you need, if a design costs you $20 million, you need revenue of 10x. You need revenue of 200 million. 
so one of the advantages that China has is actually lower labor costs. Uh, labor costs are going up, but if you look at the R&D, if you look at the lower costs of some of the Chinese companies, you see the R&D of the engineers, fully loaded costs about $60,000, $70,000. In Silicon Valley, it's about $220,000, $230,000. So you can see a 3x multiple in the difference in cost. Now, productivity is lower, so you don't get that full pass-through. But again, in China, you do see that potentially lower cost, which again allows them to be more effective in certain markets. Um, this is what we show in terms of the IoT market. Uh, basically, we show the IoT devices, which we show to be a $400 billion market in, uh, in 2025. We split into consumer, which includes the fitness trackers, uh, smart cameras. Medical to us is an area that's going to come up very fast. Telemedicine is a high growth area. Automotive, I think we've underestimated automotive. Um, I think the automotive numbers will be bigger than we're showing here. Uh, we also see uh, the home, the smart home coming in. Doxis 3.1 will be a key technology. Logistics is already a big market. Uh, this includes the RFID. NXP is doing very well in this space. NXP, frankly, is doing extremely well in the, in the NFC area. And then other basically new applications include robotics and so on. If you look at the semiconductor consumption, uh, we're showing about uh, 91 billion. Uh, we have another chart which splits it by product, where we also show software. Uh, we estimate that in 2025, China will be about 50% of the IoT market. Uh, Xiaomi produced a fitness tracker, uh, 79 RMB. Uh, in terms of euros, about 15 euros. They sold it out in one day. Obviously a loss leader, uh, but basically starting to stimulate the market. Smart cameras are coming in quite, quite actively in China. And then, as I mentioned, the machine vision, robotics is big. Uh, the key drone maker is really a, is a Chinese company. And of course, they're based in Hong Kong. But again, you see, you see these IoT capabilities coming in quite fast in China. And of course, 5G will stimulate that. 5G, as I mentioned earlier, will give you low, very low data rates, so you go directly from the machine to the cloud. Uh, and of course, you also have the very high data rates in terms of the high definition video, which, in, which will basically support telemedicine and other industries. So again, this is another area where we do see significant changes occurring in terms of the China market. Um, this shows the automotive supply chain by geographic region. Uh, you can see China is the biggest producer in terms of number of vehicles globally. The China automobile market, though, is in trouble. Uh, they produce about 20 million, 22 million a year. Uh, the roads are crowded, no places to put them. Um, going to the rural areas, basically, you don't have the buying power. So they're going to have to change from being uh, China-based to becoming export-based. And I think that's going to happen over the next few years. And to do that, there has to be a significant increase in quality of electronics. Uh, Chinese companies cannot produce the microcontrollers, the analog products, etc. Uh, so again, we see opportunities for joint ventures. Uh, from a foreign company point of view, the company that we see as the most successful in China from, from a semiconductor module point of view and MEMS is Bosch. Outstanding performance in China. And basically, we've seen revenue growth of 50% a year. So as China automobile industry changes, this is now another major opportunity in terms of, uh, of collaboration and um, uh, joint ventures. So you've had joint ventures in terms of the automobile companies. Now we think opportunities in terms of joint ventures for the supply chains. So in terms of the conclusion, <coughs> what we do see in China is a large and growing market for semiconductors. Um, the level of technology of Chinese companies supplying semiconductors is increasing. As I mentioned, Huawei High Silicon has done designs in 16, but as I also mentioned, yield problems with TSMC and FinFETs. And of course, that's not uncommon with FinFETs. Um, other companies are also having problems with FinFETs. Um, the other issue, though, is the level of sophistication of demand for semiconductors in China is going up at a faster rate than the Chinese companies can supply. Uh, 
so who are the leading vendors? Well, for, for data centers, Intel is the leading vendor. Intel has a very strong position. In terms of the modems, uh, Qualcomm is in a strong position, but MediaTek is coming up very fast. Spectrum, though, is actually strengthening. Spectrum will produce 500 million modems this year. 500 million. Their revenue is 1.5 billion. So the average price is $3. Uh, $3, and that's actually for a chipset. Um, so again, we're seeing this, the, the combination, as I said, of the increased demand for foreign, foreign products and also then the strengthening of the, uh, of the Chinese companies. Uh, the China government and the different agencies will spend close to $100 billion. We're doing an analysis of this right now. Now, this is over five years. So the central government is allocating about $20 billion. And, uh, but then the provinces are allocating a uh, significant amount. Shanghai, uh, Shenzhen is starting to build, Beijing, obviously, uh, E-Town Capital, these organizations are very active. So we're basically doing the bottom-up analysis of this $100 billion between now and 2020. Uh, so it could be cut back a little bit, but it is, it is significant. Um, and of course, you cannot build it, you cannot take this money and build this something like organically. So there has to be collaboration. I think the IMEC collaboration in terms of SMIC, in terms of the FinFETs, is really good. Uh, but again, as I said, I don't think it's going to be successful. The IMEC collaboration with Citri, though, in terms of MEMS, is a winner. And I think Citri is also collaborating with Cytec. And uh, the SOI initiatives in China, we think, will be winners also. Uh, SOI, basically, obviously, as you all probably know, is widely used for filters. And um, that filter market for the 5G will grow significantly, or 4G and also 5G will grow significantly. So we're seeing some joint ventures already being established. And uh, some of them look very promising. Others, though, are still a bit speculative. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, uh, the, the supply or the, demand, the commitment to 3D NAND, 2D NAND is becoming obsolete. Uh, low endurance and uh, basically enterprise is gone. Uh, now the client will be gone also. So there's going to be a lot of excess capacity in, in 2D NAND, but 3D NAND will ramp rapidly. Uh, we also see the application process activities, all winner, um, all winner. Uh, is, is, a, is an interesting company. Rockship has been collaborating with Intel. That relationship, though, is not effective. All Winner is collaborating right now with, with um, Qualcomm. Again, not effective. So again, we, we do see a lot of relationships, but not many of them are being well thought through and being planned. Uh, More than we talked about, Wi-Fi. We do see uh, Wi-Fi hotspots being established in China, and then also the use of unlimited spectrum. Uh, we do see the full AD LED lighting supply chain in China. LED lighting is a big market. And China today produces probably about 95% of fluorescent light bulbs. Uh, they're very, there's a lot of contamination, uh, some significant issues with fluorescent light bulbs. Uh, so to, 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 to get rid of that issue, basically, the migration to LED lighting. And of course, supply chain in China is coming up very fast. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, $10 billion has been spent on flat panel displays, and it is quite successful. It is quite successful. Not as good as Samsung, not as good as, uh, as LG, not as good as some of the Taiwanese, but actually quite good, and able to support uh, 4K. Uh, so again, what we see is the willingness to make big expenditures, to take the big risks, and if you look at semiconductors and electronics as a percentage of GDP, it is still quite small. Uh, but again, the willingness to make these big investments, I wish US government would do the same thing. But again, uh, US government has other priorities. Uh, also, I think in Europe, I think uh, there should be more investment. We're actually actively doing, we're actually doing some, some work with the French government, and some of that is promising, but again, there are some issues. The one problem, though, that you do have with the manufacturing capacity is that you have to operate it at high levels of capacity utilization. Um, so China has to manage demand as well as supply. And they also have to manage 
the transition to new technologies because the worst thing that you can have is large manufacturing capacity in old technologies that are not cost effective. So that level of sophistication is not in China yet. The level of management expertise of most, Jap of most Chinese companies is quite weak. Um, so that has to be strengthened. And of course, there's a training, internal training. But again, the best way, in our opinion, to get that management expertise is through joint ventures. And uh, as we, uh, about a year ago, when we talked about joint ventures to the China government, the government agencies, they, they basically smiled. Today, as they start seeing some failures, now there's an increased recognition that joint ventures will become increasingly important because if you compete in the advanced technologies, you need also that management skill set in addition to technology. So it's a learning process. And again, I think for Europe, uh, I think th this is a major, major opportunity. So as I mentioned earlier, and again, I don't want to be repetitive, 5G will be disruptive. 5G will be one of the big things that will hit the electronics industry and semiconductor industry. There'll be the ma the machine-to-machine ma -machine communication, the automobile, to ma automobile communication, and then connectivity to the cloud. And the trials are starting right now. There'll be initial deployment in uh, the uh, 2018, and basically initial commercialization in 2020. I was shown a base station box, which is about this big square today for 5G. It has to become this big which means new power amplifiers, new filters. Uh, in today's base stations, there are two or three filters, uh, big filters. In the 5G base stations, there'll be 500 filters, 500. And they have to be small. So a very different uh, type of technology. Um, so we do see this, as I said, as being disruptive. But I think the China investment, the total investment in China, we think, in R&D for 5G right now, is about $2 billion a year. And we think inside Huawei, there's about a billion. And if you then look at the number of engineers uh, with a cost load of cost of $75,000, $80,000 per year, that's a lot of engineers. <clears throat> and then in our opinion also, IoT will be highly synergistic with 5G. IoT, when you have connectivity to the cloud, will actually grow quite rapidly as 5G comes in. So we do think acquisitions will continue to be made. Uh, we're actively working on a number of acquisitions right now. The problem with acquisitions, though, is that once you acquire the company, how do you motivate the management to stay? Uh, if you buy a company and you, 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 you buy out the management, the management becomes rich. Do you then want to work for a uh, Chinese SOE? And the answer is you work out your contract, but then you, you leave and you start another company. We've seen that with the RDA acquisition uh, by Tsinghua Unigroup. Uh, the president, the chairman, or uh, president founder, Vincent, who is a good friend of mine, uh, left. And the, uh, quite a number of the management team has left. So acquisitions on the surface looks good, but keeping the, the acquired companies motivated, keeping the management is going to be very difficult. So in our assessment, Joint ventures are by far the best way to go. But you have to manage joint ventures very carefully because what you have is the potential for leaking of IoT, sorry, the IP. And you also have to basically make sure that you, that you maintain control over the joint ventures. Um, so some of the automotive joint ventures in Japan have had good success. A number of joint ventures, again, have not had good success. So one has to manage its a joint ventures like a baby. You, you have to give it a lot of care and attention when it's very young, and as it grows up and it becomes a teenager, it becomes even more difficult to manage. So joint ventures need very close management. Uh, but again, in our opinion, this is the way to manage uh, China. The other thing we find out with China, and again, I don't claim to be an expert, uh, it's very difficult to get to know Chinese people. I have the analogy in my first book, you go to the Forbidden City, you go inside one gate, and you think you're inside, but you're not. Then you go inside another gate, and you think you're inside, you're not. And you keep on going inside these gates, and you actually never get inside. So, but there has to be an investment in terms of building relationships, and we find Chinese to be very much relationships-based. And I think one characteristic, frankly, of Europeans is they are much more relationship-based than US, 
Uh, and I think in the US, we tend to want to do things very quickly and get it over with. I think here you're more patient. But I think there has to be an investment in time, uh, effort, and willingness to spend time in China and build the relationships. Once the relationships are built, though, I think they can actually be very, very strong. And if you look at the family relationships in China, they're very, very strong. So you have to make investments. And it isn't just money, it's investments in time and establishing relationships. And by the way, you know, as a side issue, a company that I think we've seen do an excellent job of establishing relationships in China is Cytec. Uh, I've been to China many times and I've seen Cytec. They actually made significant investments in building relations, and I think over the next few years, I think you see Soitec having very good success in China. Um, we do see volatility in China. Um, it is dependent on exports. Exports have slowed, and I think exports in 2016, 2017 will be a problem. Internal consumption is growing, but not near enough to satisfy the reduction in exports. Um, I think you'll see volatility. There has been overbuilding in housing. But most of those houses or most of those apartments have been paid for in cash. There's a lot of excess cash in China. Uh, the stock market volatility was not really because of institutional investors. It was actually excess money. Uh, they couldn't buy apartments, so they put the excess money. There's a lot of excess cash in China. Uh, so I think you'll see a lot of volatility, but I think you, do, you will see long-term success. China has many problems. Um, the thing that encourages us, though, is that when you talk to the government officials, they recognize the problems. And there's a willingness to accept them and to try and come with solutions. So we do see China managing its problems more effectively than many other countries. So again, we're not uh, purely optimistic. We do see the problems. We do see the volatility. But long term, as I said, we do see excellent potential in China. So that is the end of my talk. If you have any questions, any challenges, anything I can cover in more detail, I'd be happy to do that. And again, I would encourage you to make the investments in building relationships in China and having a long-term perspective on the China opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very the spectrum on the, and the semiconductor industry for China and also the key messages of how we can benefit from it. And I think that ties in nicely with the next speaker. But before I move to the next speaker, I'll, I think we have time for one or two quick questions, if there are any burning ones. No? Okay. I, I maybe, Dr. Jones, I have one question for sure. you, if I may. So you mentioned collaboration um, is key for success for, let's say, European business. Uh, but also that has challenges uh, in terms of, let's say, the IP, the leakage, and how we can move forward. Based on successful stories, how do you think we can manage that? How do you think we can maintain being relevant in Europe, uh, but also use the leverage, leverage the collaboration with China? Yeah, I, that's, a, that's a very good question. We've been asked that question a number of times because many companies are very nervous about um, joint ventures in China. Um, you have to install managers there. You have to install a number of your own managers, and I think you have to install, uh, and you have to have some control over the day-to-day -day operations of the uh, joint venture. Uh, just letting it run by itself will not give you good success. So a key part, as I said, is to, is to have your own management there and manage it on a day-to-day -day basis. 